So this lesson will cover the basics of hemodynamics. Hemodynamics are the measurements we take of the various pressures or volumes within the heart and the cardiovascular system. These numbers can help us to determine if something's wrong with our patient, and if so, what it is and what we can do about it. So when we talk about hemodynamics, it's important to understand what constitutes a full cardiac cycle. Um, it's a full cycle of relaxation and contraction. So uh, relaxation or diastole is when the ventricles fill with blood. That's the relaxation phase. Um, and then systole is when the atria and the ventricles contract and push the blood out of the heart. That's your systolic phase. So we have diastole, which is relaxation. We have systole, which is contraction. So as you'll see in just a second, the atria will actually contract a split second before the ventricles. We call that our atrial kick. That just helps to fill the ventricles all the way before they push the blood out to the body. So you have atrial systole, then ventricular systole a split second later. When the ventricles do contract, they force blood out of the pulmonary artery and the aorta to go out to the lungs or to the body to send that blood out where it needs to go. Now, one great way to visualize what's happening in the heart during this full cardiac cycle is something called a Wigger's diagram. Now, this isn't something that you need to memorize, but it's a really helpful visual to see how everything relates to each other. At the bottom, you'll see the phonocardiogram. This is our heart sounds. Now, we talked about heart sounds in a previous lesson, so go back and check on that if you need to. But remember that systole, that's our S1 sound, and diastole is our S2 sound. So we hear that systole S1, that's our lub. Then we hear our diastole S2, that's our dub. And then notice you have a bit of a pause. We call that the diastolic pause. So S1, S2, pause, S1, S2, pause, okay? Um, now, you can also see the EKG tracing right above that where you see ventricular systole right here with the QRS. Then you have this pause for diastole. Then you have your P wave, which is atrial systole, right before ventricular systole again. So refer to the EKG lesson to learn more about your PQRST complexes. But again, you can just see how the LUB S1 relates to that QRS. Um, now, when we look at ventricular volume and pressure, this is just a really cool way to see exactly what's moving around within the heart. So in systole, we see that the ventricles suddenly contract. So this blue wave is your pressure. So your pressure shoots up because your ventricles are pushing and contracting and forcing that blood out. And then you'll see, because they're forcing that blood out, the volume is going to go down. So the ventricles are emptying themselves out to push push that blood out of the heart. You'll see as the pressure comes back down, the ventricles are relaxing and they're filling back up with blood. Now, right here is where you'll see this atrial kick, okay? So you have atrial systole right before ventricular systole. The pressure goes up in the atria and it pushes that last little bit of volume into the ventricles before it contracts again and empties out, okay? So think about this way, any patient who has issues with their atria and they lose their atrial kick is going to have trouble with their overall cardiac output because there's just going to be that last little bit of volume that's not going to make it into the ventricles. Best example of this is going to be somebody with atrial fibrillation, okay? So this is kind of cool. There's a cheat sheet attached to this lesson that shows you this diagram so you can really just see how everything relates to each other. So let's just look really quickly at some basic terms that you need to know, and then we'll talk about how they fit together. The first is just your basic heart rate. That's how fast your heart is beating. Um, we measure that in beats per minute or BPM, and normal is 60 to 100. Now, everybody's normal is different, but that's the, that's the basic normal. Uh, then stroke volume. Stroke volume is how much volume is pumped out of the heart with each beat. So we measure that in milliliters because it's a volume, and the normal Stroke volume is about 60 to 120. Now, cardiac output is the total volume pumped out of the heart in an entire minute. So the way we calculate that is we say how much volume per beat and how many beats per minute, and we multiply them together. So your cardiac output equals your heart rate times your stroke volume, okay? Normally, we're going to get something like four to eight liters per minute. Now, for a 90-pound gymnast, four liters per minute might be plenty, but it would not be enough for a 300-pound wrestler, right? So we use something called cardiac index 
to help us account for the patient's size to determine whether it's actually a sufficient cardiac output for them or not. So we take that cardiac output and we divide it by their body surface area and that gives us the cardiac index. We want a cardiac index between about 2.5 to 4. So if we had a 300-pound wrestler and gave him a cardiac output of 4, we'd probably have a cardiac index of about 1.5, which is definitely not enough for that patient, okay? So that's purpose of cardiac index. Now, ejection fraction is literally the percentage or the fraction of blood forced out of the left ventricle with uh, each beat, okay? So let's just say hypothetically that the ventricle fills with 100 milliliters and it pumps out 40 of them. So that's going to mean that our ejection fraction or the amount that we pumped out was about 40%. Okay. Normal ejection fraction, 55 to 75. You'll see when we talk about heart failure is we start to see way low ejection fractions like less than 50. Now these last three, I'm just going to mention quickly, and then we're going to talk about them in detail in their own lesson, which is the next one. Um, but the first one is preload. Preload is the measure of stretch or the filling pressure within the heart. So the more it's stretched or filled during diastole, the higher the preload and vice versa. Think pre equals before. So it's the blood before the heart as it comes in and fills it up. Then afterload is the force that the heart pumps against in order to eject that blood out. So it has to overcome that pressure in order to be able to get the valves open and get that blood out of the heart out of the heart. So think afterload against, okay? And then contractility is just the force or the strength of the contraction of the ventricles. Again, make sure you check out the preload and afterload lesson to learn more about these three. Now we have all these numbers and we need to know how they relate to each other. So we'll start by looking at our cardiac output. Um, like we said before, cardiac output is your uh, stroke volume times heart rate, right? So we can really quickly affect cardiac output simply by influencing the patient's heart rate. So what would we do for a patient whose heart rate was too slow? Well, we could give things like atropine. Um, that's an anticholinergic that helps to increase it. Or we could give sympathomimetics like epi. Both of those things will help to increase a patient's heart rate. Um, and then what do we do if it's too fast? Um, if your heart rate's too fast, there's a couple things we can do. One is just simple vagal maneuvers. So that would be like coughing or bearing down. Um, the other thing we can do is treat the cause. So if maybe they're anxious or they're dehydrated, we want to address the reason why their heart rate's too high. Um, and then if it's a significant issue, we can actually look into cardioversion to address that too fast heart rate. Okay. So now we want to look at the determinants of stroke volume. So this is how we're going to affect our heart rate. Let's look at how we would affect our stroke volume. So there's three things that affect, uh, that determine our stroke volume that we can affect. One, like we talked about, is preload. The other one is afterload. And the last one is contractility. Okay. So again, preload is the stretch or filling pressure of the heart. Afterload is the pressure the heart has to pump against, and contractility is the force with which the ventricles are able to squeeze to get blood out of the heart. What's important to note here is that if one of these decreases, the others are going to have to increase in order to compensate and maintain the same cardiac output. Think about a water balloon. If you have a water balloon um, and you want to score water out of it, in let's say five seconds. Let's see how much we can get out in five seconds. It's entirely going to be determined by how much you fill it, how much you squeeze it, and how hard you're squeezing the opening of this balloon or how much you let it go, right? Now, if you do it again, but this time you don't fill it as much and you have it less full, then to get the same amount of water out in that five seconds, you're either going to have to squeeze it harder or you're going to have to let go of the opening, right? So that's the same thing. If your preload goes down, in order to maintain the same output, you need to squeeze it harder or you need to release some of that pressure that it has to fight against. Does that make sense? So we'll look in much more detail in these three things at the preload and afterload lesson, but I really wanted you to see where they fit in into this big hemodynamic picture. So what are the key points here? Well, remember that a full cardiac cycle involves systole and diastole or contraction and relaxation. And then there's that pause in between. 
Um, and again, these things can be visualized on that Wiggers diagram, which we've included in a, a cheat sheet attached to this lesson. So make sure you check that out. Knowing those key hemodynamic terms is going to really help you determine the source of your problem um, and understand what's going on with your patient and how you can help them. Think of the hemodynamics like different things a mechanic checks on a car. There's tire pressure, gas mileage, coolant levels, etc. So depending on which one is out of whack determines how they need to proceed. But ultimately, they all need to be functioning optimally for the car to run safely. As nurses, we are like mechanics, but for the heart. So look at those measure measurements and figure out what's going on with your patient so that you know how to help them. Um, and then re again, remember that all these f factors influence each other in some way. You know, if one of them goes down, we're going to need to increase the other ones in order to compensate. So everything is interrelated. Okay. Thanks for watching another nursing.com lesson. Click the link below in the description to watch thousands more lessons over on nursing.com. Also, be sure to hit the subscribe and the little bell to make sure you're reminded when new lessons come out. And if you want to just keep watching more lessons, go ahead and click this video over here to continue learning. Like we always say here at nursing.com, happy nursing.